and I suppose anyone looking to maybe just continue this conversation or to go take us in any direction is more than welcome. But maybe if they could, in asking their question or responding to what's said, maybe just give their name as well and a sense of where their own background or interest, uh, it would be very useful. So if I want to throw it open, I think we can actually maybe use this occasion. We don't often ever get someone with this expertise and level of experience in this area. We should use it wisely by asking maybe questions that, are, yes, that, that benefit us. Thank you, Susan, for a very interesting um, talk. Um, do you value views in relation to the case of the WikiLeaks volunteers whose details have been handed over to Twitter recently uh, on footage of it being deemed necessary to the um, US government's investigation into WikiLeaks and the judgment that it found that people had a lessened sense of privacy once they'd signed up to user agreements on Twitter? Whether it's ever appropriate for an ISP to release personal information about their subscribers, an ISP or a website, should be subject to judicial oversight. That's what's happened in the WikiLeaks case. Twitter came in and said, no, we don't want to tell you who our users are. They had an opportunity to quite quash the request for information. The judge says, no, we think this is necessary to the case that's going forward. You know, I'm interested in seeing the rule of law operate with, re with respect to these requests. There are so many things that could happen without exposure. This one we know about. So if we want to change the procedures, we can elect different people. We can change the law. There's a big effort going on in the United States right now to change the Electronic Communications Privacy Act to uh, require that uh, police show, for example, probable cause, uh, get a, the most judicial oversight possible before getting this kind of information. Mm -hmm. That's the road to go down. So uh, if, if, uh, we're all worried about privacy, and it's good to see public conversation about it. Do you want to wait for a microphone so just we catch, just to, so, that, so that your question is caught online as well, please? Great. It, it, Jim Devine, and I work primarily around the sort of policy and the education sector. Yeah. I was interested at the beginning, you, you, you made reference to kind of unaccountable governments and unaccountable businesses. And I, at the end, you were talking about the need to articulate principles. So I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about the kinds of principles that you, you would expect you, you to see in accountable businesses and governments. Mm -hmm. But also, if I could turn it around, I mean, there, you know, when you look at the individuals who use the internet, um, there are p individuals who will always be honorable and accountable, and there are individuals who won't be. So um, I suppose from an educational perspective, and particularly around, say, um, media literacy and digital inclusion and, and how that works its way through the school system, I mean, could you say something about um, engendering accountability in individuals? Okay, terrific. So on the first question, um, when uh, Russia asked recently that social networks voluntarily remove uh, critical content about the uh, election from their sites, Google, Facebook, Twitter, somebody else, they all refused. They said no. They banded together. And that is a moment where the businesses were trying to be accountable. Um, there have been nascent efforts around the world to build those sets of best practices so that businesses will be waiting for an appropriate kind of legal process to come to them before they give up personal information, right? And uh, before they remove information from their platforms. So I'd like to see, we'd all like to see, I think, more and more of that kind of thing where businesses feel strong enough to withstand requests from authoritarian or democratic governments for information they, they feel is inappropriate. And the way to make this possible is to make it visible. So it's, it's like the response to the question about the WikiLeaks people. How, how do we, what do we do to make businesses accountable? We make what they do more visible when it comes to giving up private information. So that's, uh, I hope that's helpful. That we, it, it's very difficult to do as a regulatory or legislative matter to tell businesses they're not allowed to operate in China, for example, I think is quite a reach to encourage them to feel strong enough on their own two feet to resist inappropriate requests is a better direction. Now, on, as to the digital literacy um, point, 
teaching honor is difficult. People say uh, the best software is between the ears. You know, it's, it's what uh, parents give to their children. Uh, it's the education in the home that's always going to make the difference from my perspective. I'm not a parent, but I'm sympathetic to parents. And um, it's very difficult to try to, uh, you could certainly have um, curricula in schools that will encourage ethical, thoughtful behavior by kids online and encourage them to think about their own privacy, but to mandate a curriculum, sort of a one-size-fits-all thing, is probably doomed. Um, just because kids are different, towns are different, it would be better to have this kind of thing emerge from uh, communities where the kids live. That's, that's my, uh, does that answer your digital literacy honorable question? Yes and no. I yeah. think the, the no bit really, um, you know, I mean, I completely, completely appreciate the um, openness and, and right. on the internet, but you, and you've, you, you know, you've made the case very clearly, but, you know, irrespective of what we do in schools, I mean, society pr produces individuals yeah. who will do bad things yes. on the, you know, right. on the internet, whether yeah. it's incitement to hatred and violence or racism or, or child pornography, whatever it might be. Um, and I'm just, you know, I'm just interested in your thoughts about, you know, in real terms, you know, what advice would you be offering governments or telcos in yeah. terms of trying to sort of tread that path between openness on the one hand and, and um, meaningful protection of society from right. crazy stuff on the other? People have been using telephones for terrible things for a long time. People use highways to go off and murder people. We don't then try to constrain the highway or the telephone system in the interest of prophylactically avoiding harm. That's the risk, to, to make the, the infrastructure itself conditioned on avoiding harm. What we should do and what we do do is when harm occurs, find a way to figure out who did it. And that's the, unfortunately, that's the WikiLeaks example as well. If we're looking to find out who did X or Y, Police need to be able to go back and trace who that was. But that's looking backward, not trying to prevent it affirmatively. And that's the line for me, um, that where a court, where some judicial authority has figured out that something illegal has happened or is at grave risk of happening, then appropriate for private actors to assist law enforcement. But turning intermediaries and telcos into a kind of private police that are looking out affirmatively for harm is a bad step, not, not good for our future. We wouldn't do it with the telephone over the highway. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Um, thanks very much for a uh, most interesting speech. Um, I just wanted to come back to the principles there and also yeah. to the EG8. I mean, what I thought was interesting about the EG8 was that you had uh, a lot of the big internet gurus attending as well. Mm -hmm. And while we were all a bit depressed about what the governments were saying, right. um, it was a forum that allowed people like Vint Cerf to um, elucidate the arguments in favour of openness and perhaps mm -hmm. also to pitch one principle against another, say, privacy versus innovation or security versus privacy. Um, and I don't know what other fora there are uh, internationally for c convening yeah. such debates. I just wonder what your feelings are about that. Well, actually, um, so on the EG8 point, absolutely right. I think got a chance to talk. There were a lot of civil society people there who felt, you know, I didn't get a chance to say anything, and others who felt they hadn't been invited. So for what it's worth, there was a sense that, yes, Sarkozy had dragged all these enormous internet companies to Paris just to show that he, you know, he could, uh, and that they got some great photos and that all seemed fine, but as a forum for actual discussion, that really didn't happen. It was more speech making and uh, not, not so much policy making. The OECD is emerging as a place uh, where there will be real discussion among the, now we need to figure out how to bring more countries into that discussion, but among the developed nations of the world. Uh, they, just a month after this EG8 meeting, released a set of principles uh, that had been done with the cooperation of civil society and academia and business and government um, that would protect intermediaries from liability, for example, because they saw that as an important role for speech in the internet uh, to make sure platforms could make that speech possible. So I have high hopes for the OECD as a, a sort of a, a new, play, new kind of forum that has uh, great dignity but is also more open 
to many different actors and, and is not just there for a precedent. Just on that, if I can, because it's yeah. interesting, uh, and to a certain extent you see that rather than the ITU yeah. being a location where you would actually formalize some of the operating principles, as it were, not just the high-level principles. How do you do that when you don't have China or India or Russia in, in the OECD? I mean, how do you, how can you get a, a the really large pop, you know, areas population included mm -hmm. and developing with the areas where the internet's going to develop most in the next five, ten years? Right. How, how do you get them in the OECD? Well, when I'm speaking of principles, for me, they are still right now high level, not fine grained principles, but principles about, for example, intermediary liability and uh, against filtering, that kind of thing, not dictating to the operators how they run their businesses. I think that will still be left to the national governments. Um, you would hope that as large economies, India and Russia, would see the benefit of being part of the, that internet rather than cutting themselves off from it. That's always the hope. So that even if they're not formal members of the OECD, they feel the need to be connected to the internet. It's not a great answer, because they're not there, but it's the best I can do. Yeah. It's interesting, because it's, it's the same in the energy area. They're not there. Right. And they should be there. They should be there. They should be there. It's not recent. There's a microphone there. Uh, Ronan and Tynan, I just want to ask this question really from a human rights perspective. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate you on packing so much into a short presentation. Um, all right, this question really relates to uh, businesses and what they do when they're confronted by autocratic regimes in particular, but I think you did a great job in highlighting the potential hypocrisy of the West or developed right. countries in lecturing China and so forth, because Chinese are highly sensitive to hypocrisy in that context, and one can right. empathize with them to some extent under Absolutely. that rubric, if you like. Yeah. Uh, so the question is really, how or what type of instrument can and will, do you foresee being developed that would allow companies some defense when they're asked to hand over critical information, life-threatening information? I remember, for example, the hearings in the US Congress, uh, which I watch, where Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft were hauled in. And I have a vivid memory of a, a, a quite a right-wing Republican congressman who was chairman of that subcommittee, waving a book in the faces to the highly embarrassed executives of that company about IBM's collaboration with the Nazis, you know, going way back in RV, yeah. you know, they collaborated my major multinational with the Nazis, which was a, a fascinating uh, uh, thing to observe, you know. And the company's defense kept coming back to the point, we have to observe the laws of jurisdictions in which we operate, right. which of course, when you consider the evolution of human rights law, that's a pretty pathetic <laughs> response, yes. you know. Right. Uh, but there was one suggestion by the council for Google which I looked into a little, uh, the, the notion of making uh, censorship a form of restraint of trade, you know, a violation yeah. of free trade, which yeah. is rather, it, it, there would be a beautiful solution if one could bring human rights right into the <laughs> transactional domain of commerce, <laughs> if it could yeah. be done. So I would really be fascinated by what uh, thinking you could offer us, or maybe hope in, in that area. Thanks very much. Oh, that's a wonderful question. Thank you for that. And there is, um there's a lot of talk about put, putting this over into the trade regime. It's, right now it's still talk, maybe a page of bullet points now exists on this idea, but it, it, it makes a lot of sense because you are ra raising barriers to the ability of a company to do business by holding up the threat, the cloud of censorship, and that uh, you know, a, a company will always, its customers will always be worried that they'll be turned over to the police. That's a barrier to trade. So those companies, Microsoft, Yahoo, and Google, formed a group they call the Global Network Initiative. Now the problem with the Global Network Initiative is that it's not global. It's only these three American companies, and they weren't able to persuade telcos so far to join. But the idea was a good one, that they would adopt a set of principles that, against which they would be audited by human rights groups um, after you know, experience in responding to foreign regimes. That experiment is still marching forward. If that could be expanded, made maybe a little less heavyweight, so more um, companies join it, that would be a, a good way to, again, give them sort of the strength to stand on their own two feet and say, we won't do it. Notice in Russia, they act as a body. We're all not going to do it. And you need that kind of group boycott. If you're picked off as a single company, very difficult. Can you just have to leave that market? So both of these ideas, both the quasi self-regulatory notion of having principles that you sign up to and the human rights advocates take a look at, 
and then the trade barrier idea, which would take years to implement, are, are both powerful and interesting suggestions. Thank you for that. But, so, yes? I was looking to ask you, 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 touched on, um, you touched on uh, the content industries yeah. uh, in terms of their attempts in the Stop Online Piracy Act. Um, and I'm, well, I think we could sense that you're not a particular fan of the act. No. You seem to be at least aware that the problem exists in their industries, uh, like a threat from the online uh, method of piracy. And online piracy in general is definitely a problem uh, on some level. And I'm wondering if you could perhaps outline what your ideal relationship would be between the content industry and the technology industry uh, and the telco industry in terms of trying to you know, <laughs> trying to maintain as much as possible uh, the content industry's ability to continue to produce high quality content while at the same time not at all restricting the other aspects that come into play? Well, um, I think I've tried to express the idea that we shouldn't design the internet to favor any one industry. And at this point, Hollywood is powerful enough that they would like to see things designed to favor them. Who else are we going to pick the next time? You know, does aerospace want their own special internet? So um, that can't be the right direction. On the other hand, the uh, intermediary liability, uh, lack of you know, safe harbor scheme we have in place in the United States is evidently unstable. It's not going to survive. Something has to change. And so the ideal relationship from my standpoint would be to have the uh, you know, to have everyone understand that it's in their best interest, including the content industry's best interest, to have an open, accessible internet that's widespread around the world. That has to be in their, ultimately in their long-term interest. That it would be appropriate, as I tried to indicate during the talk, to stop American payment mechanisms from assisting uh, true pirates, how you figure out who a true pirate it is hard, but to use the ends of the networks, the payments, as places to uh, you know, intervene, rather than to dig right into the hardware of the internet and say, we're going to monkey around with IP addresses and domain names. Because that, I don't think they quite appreciate how dangerous that is to the operation of the internet as a whole. And it's sort of this benevolent, like, well, of course we should be blocking pirated sites. Well, Yes, but what's a pirated site? You know, what kinds of uh, responses are the DNS resolvers going to give? What does this do to our ability to hinder man-in-the-middle attacks? Right now, there's this whole idea. It's called DNSSEC, uh, which would allow a user or a website to know that the request that it's getting is coming from the source that says they're speaking. So a way of uh, authenticating a request saying, yes, that, that name is real, it's called DNSSEC. If uh, SOPA went into effect, that entire um, uh, guaranteed channel wouldn't exist because the ISPs would be breaking off the communication in the middle and refusing to let sites resolve that were on that list. That's a great danger to security. So for technical and lots of other reasons, it's just a bad idea to, to monkey with the um, technology in the middle. And so the ideal relationship would be one where everybody understands their long-term interests rather than just digging into the short-term things that will serve their particular business model. How's that sound? That's that very, it, it just shows the technical nature of this is critical. Oh, that's yeah, why, That's why policymakers find it so difficult to understand even that technological effect, the man right. in the middle right. measure you said. Why is it that when we're, as I understand, we're starting to see some instances of the end solution to content protection, it, be it restricting advertising or search capability or payment systems, as you say. From what I understand, that's starting to happen. Google is starting to do it and, mm -hmm. uh, in some form or other, under pressure probably. Why is it that politically, even though that's starting to evolve, that there's this such, that there's a, not only in America, but in Ireland here, we've, yeah. we're addressing this issue of three strikes and or some yeah. format of, of internet service intervention uh, in France, in a whole mm -hmm. range of different countries. Right. Why is it when, when there is starting to evolve an alternative approach, as you say, that it's not just theoretical, it's, it's starting to happen, that politically the, we are going into the middle of the, we're, we're doing heart surgery rather than for a broken finger. Yeah, very good, yeah, it's true. Well, a lot of this has to do, uh, frankly, with public servants 
who are afraid to ask questions and don't really understand how this works and are told that this is just like land. Look, my property, my land is being taken by somebody else. You've got to stop them from taking it. And that's a very simple argument to understand. And the, com the technical complexity of how the internet functions is, is still hard for people to, to grasp. So I think um, one of our key roles has to be to educate ministers to understand how this whole thing works. Not easy. Not easy. <laughs> <laughs> From experience, not <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so it's a mission for me. I, that's one. Of, I'm going to the Kennedy School and the Harvard Law School starting in January, initially for a year, just because I have this mission to try to help ministers understand the technology um, and appreciate what it can do for them in government too. Provide services less expensively. You know, reach people more easily. Get real citizen input. All that. There are a lot of goods that come with technology. It's not all pirates and predators and all things that start with P. You know, there are other things going on. Can I just take you back to your last remark yeah. and ask you to expand on the interaction between property rights and the technological nature of the internet? Because obviously the content owner's argument is that there isn't a new relationship, that they're two separate things and you have to make one fit the other. I forgot to ask, I know your name, but can you give your name? Sorry, William Early. That's right. Right, very good. <clears throat> okay, well. Let's start with copyright, so I teach copyright. So uh, it's not the same thing as land, because you can't even decide whether X act infringes Y unless a court or some authority says, no, no, that's a direct infringement. It's very difficult to say that one act in the world is an infringement unless it's an absolute copy. <clears throat> OK, but then they say, well, everything is or these pirate sites are just handing off copies of movies. That's an infringement. And you say, fine, but that site could be doing a lot of other things. Maybe it has one infringing article on it that's short, and it's got all kinds of other stuff. By blocking an IP address, you run the risk of having huge unintended consequences for lots of innocent actors that have their stuff posted on that site. So there's one sort of quasi-technical response. And the other is to engineer the internet in order to serve a very few companies' uh, property interests, let's just call them that, has unintended consequences that would undermine the world economy. That it is better for all of us to allow for a little piracy in exchange for having a world market. That's, that's a pretty big trade-off. And uh, that we shouldn't burn the village to save it. Uh, the, the content industry will always say, well, people are afraid of putting their stuff online because it might be stolen. Well, in the offline world, they assume a certain percentage of piracy. That just happens. It's part of their business. And that may be the same online, that trying to create a perfect regulatory regime has consequences that would be far beyond, far out of proportion to the benefits that would accrue to those few companies. Yeah. Am I on? Yeah. I am on. Uh, Susan, thanks so much for that. We had uh, Evgeny Morozov in here maybe a month ago, yeah. and he was saying almost exactly the opposite of most of the things you said. Yeah. And while I would have disagreed with him before he entered the room, he was very compelling. I agreed with him once he left, and now yeah. I agree with you. So, <laughs> there you go. So uh, 10 out of 10 to you both, but it leaves me wondering who's right and who's wrong and whether there's a gray area. And a totally unrelated question to that statement is, um, why is it that lawyers have in a sense, owned a lot of these, these debates. We could be debating a whole lot of stuff about what the internet is doing. And yet it seems that the, the law departments, you know, uh, especially in the states, have very, very quickly dominated the discussion of where the technology is going. I don't say that as a complaint, but when you look at the, the rounds of research happening, the next round of research then is social scientists are getting in on the act. Yeah. And there hasn't been a, a third wave. So it's a broad question. Why law right from the beginning after the engineers got in there? Why were the lawyers next? Well, you saw this in the formation of ICANN, actually. The engineers came up with TCPIP, came up with IP addresses, and they're completely impatient with policy, completely, which is good. I mean, they're, they're making things happen. They're making it work. So the lawyers, they just sit in their seats and work on the policy, and though they end up showing up to the meetings and end up having a bigger say. 
it's still true. So an engineer will say, ah, forget it. I can, I can route around you guys. I don't need to deal with Washington um, in my country. That, that turns out not to be true. And we do need much more of a technical approach to these issues. But the language of policy and the language of engineering do not work together. The engineers say there's a right and a wrong answer. Policymakers say, well, there may be a compromise. You know, and this stakeholder got me a few votes last week, and so. So that these two worlds really don't intersect very neatly. What we need are policymakers who are willing to show up to the meetings, who have an engineering background, and are able to bring a, just a sprinkling of reality into the talks that go on in the political realm. We don't have that right now. So I'm sorry the lawyers have such a say. It's just that they're, ones who, they're the ones who show up and talk. What? It wasn't a complaint. No, no, it, it's, it's a, it has been a, it's been a problem from the beginning, no question. So, uh, and the social scientists will come, and then I hope that the engineers will too, but MIT does not have a policy school. Um, uh, the Institute uh, in Delhi, the, which is far more sophisticated than MIT in many ways, doesn't have a policy school. They, these two academic realms are also quite separate. And it is not a ticket to being the top minister of communications in America to be an engineer. You're always somebody else. You're a lawyer or someone's staffer. So until all of that cultural DNA changes, so some people die off, this is the way it's going to work. So, yeah. Thank you. I'm just going back to your, your comments about the international you know, fora where these discussions happen. Yeah. And um, going back to, um, as a policy person who doesn't quite get all of this, but I'm learning quickly. The, <laughs> So much is, is um, expected of technology and communication for development. The whole, entire green economy discussion is based on technology for development. If you're sitting in the UN and talking about anything, whether it's water or it's energy, there's a technology component. If, whether it's banking and transactions and cross-border movement of money, there's a technology component, and that is all about development and sustainable development and lowering costs and leapfrogging. I, what, is, what is your perspective on this? Because they're, they're closely linked yet they're occurring in uh, rooms very separate from one another, and everything you're discussing today never comes across the, the guidance and the talking points of those who are talking about the green economy. You put in as appropriate, you put in certain types of qualifying language that makes agreements uh, somewhat neutral or somewhat acceptable to the countries around the table, um, but it's, it, it's, um, there's a real disconnect Mm -hmm. That's fascinating, and it's a disconnect personally for me because I've never been in the development conversations. So for me, it's been all this sort of <coughs> hard-boiled, big operator, big nation kinds of talk and not about uh, the possibility for development because I think it's sort of the hierarchy of needs for a country that has no infrastructure. The first thing they want is to have infrastructure that makes uh, these other steps possible, and they're not thinking about the path dependencies of what kind of infrastructure they allow or what kind of political power uh, is exerted on that infrastructure. And so they may, in fact, the, the way these two things are fitting together is that uh, leaders of the ITU are going to developing nations saying you're not being well served by uh, multi-stakeholder uh, organizations <coughs> like ICANN and you really should want not only UN funding <coughs> for your operations but also UN control and that's a very attractive argument to uh, some developing nations. So they're sort of trailing along behind and joining the ITU tent. So it would be good to find a way to communicate uh, to nations that, whose infrastructure is not yet well developed that these political questions about openness are really vital and will um, create uh, economic growth, productivity, opportunities that otherwise might not be available and that, are, that they're in their long-term interests. But if the only people they're talking to are either the operators or international bodies that have their own interests and control, they won't even hear those messages. We haven't found a way to reach the 77. We don't have a dialogue on, on all this openness policy with them. And that's a huge gap, and I'm hoping that somebody comes forward to, to reach that, to provide the training and opportunity to learn. Do okay, you have any suggestions who that might be? I don't. No, I, you know, I, maybe should a great university, should Oxford, should Cambridge, should somebody, Trinity, say, all 77 nations come here, let's talk about the future of the internet in your country. 
maybe that's a way to do it. I don't have to do it. Yeah. Oh, whoever, this gentleman over here. Susan Callum Lyon from Real X Payments. I enjoyed your comment about stopping all the payments happening. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, well. Uh, we, I won't vote for that one. But uh, um, the, the, uh, I don't know if I actually understand this question myself, but I'll try. The, the difference between um, you know, regulation and bringing in regulation on an internet perspective or, or trying to bring in new legislation you know, to control the, what right. these people might or might not do. But yet there is a, already... like loads of legislation out there to do lots of things. So that I take the gaming sector, for example, and the online gaming in the US where the US authorities, like you don't need any more legislation and yeah. they're actually very active already like in stopping online gaming when it, when it operates, no matter where it is in the world, and they'll, they'll, they'll go anywhere to stop it. Because that legislation is already there. And in many respects, there's lots of legislation already there maybe, but people don't see, tend to enforce it if it's online. There's kind of this thing that it's kind of, but if that was on TV, we would do something about it. If that was in the press, we might do something about it. But because it's online, we tend to kind of not do so much or so quickly about it. So it's really just your thoughts on, on that. I'm not sure I understood the question, but um, I, can, I can throw out some facts, uh, see if that helps. So on online gaming, it is true that the US, although we provide, I think, more than 50% of the gambling population online, we nonetheless are trying to outlaw uh, internet gambling, and we do it the U.S. government does it through uh, the payment me mechanism right now, saying that uh, we won't, uh, government won't allow payment um, companies to complete payments to online gambling, gambling sites. But it's only done domestically. Not, we're not telling people gambling outside the United States that they can't use payment but mechanisms. We're telling companies who are outside trying to sell into the U.S. That's right, because they have an effect yeah. on the jurisdictional That's hook right. is they have an effect on a U.S. citizen. Yeah, and they US went as far as the ISPs, I think, last time as well. So they actually went to the ISPs to, to take down the sites. Right. So, yeah. That's not such a great approach, right. in my view. Um, so there, there, there are levers that governments look to to try to protect their citizens. And for me, the effects on speech are less by going after payment mechanisms than the effect of going after the IP address as a whole. So it's a compared to what question. And the, the burden of the payment lever is less on the overall structure of the internet. I know that's not, not a great answer from your perspective, but it's a, yeah, comparative. Sorry, just a comment. Um, have we not been here before? We had a UN World Summit and Information Society two stage summit, and out of that came the Internet Governance Forum. So, like, it's been debated and debated about government involvement. Right. Uh, what's different this time? Uh, what's different this time is that the so the World Summit on Information Society and the IGF were viewed as outlets for this kind of concern and, and discussion. That is no longer viewed as sufficient by the people who are uh, behind the ITU effort. They would like to drive towards real reification of uh, government control. So it's sort of giving up on the IGF as a forum is what's going on at this point. The Internet Governance Forum, if you guys get addicted to this stuff, you can spend months of your life going to meetings. Uh, with, uh, so I'm here to try to compress some of the information that, that happens there. I'm sure there are lots of veterans here at those meetings. Can I ask a racial question to that? Because right. what I heard you saying as much as anything else is a call to social activism, yeah. in, as well as corporate activism for some people that will be relevant. Where, where does that, where does, how does that develop? How do you get people in Ireland to get agitated about what's happening in Moscow? Or, yeah. or what's happening in Washington, or how, uh, until I suppose the point when it arrives at your door. Yeah. Um, but, but even then, it's, it's, a, it's a very technical issue. You have particularly, uh, you've got very strong economic actors who can spend a lot of money making mm -hmm. it even more complex, possibly, or, or less easy to understand. Where does, the, where does the social activism take place, and how is it, um, how can it evolve? If, as you say, we've already talked talk this high and dry up at the UN right. and elsewhere, how do you change the politics of it through social activism, or who is doing that? Well, like any social movement, it starts with some committed individuals who are rational enough to be listened to by lots of people and uh, who are able to somehow encapsulate the issue. We, we don't only care about people within our own borders as humans. We're able to 
empathize when there's a crisis, when you see a tsunami happen, something visible, are able to worry about that. And with the Arab Spring, I think you've seen people around the world express concern about internet access being cut off and communications being constrained. Now, granted, those were again, crises. What we've got now is a slower moving crisis. If there's a way to make that visible to the rest of the world, so you see it, you see a map of where things are getting censored, it becomes for you a cause like Doctors Without Frontiers or, you know, we're, we're able to worry about other amorphous things. Why couldn't we make this one visible and actionable for, for people within Ireland? Starting with individuals, leading groups, having an impact by assisting activists maybe in Syria or other countries where the things are really cut down, and then seeing yourself as a global citizen. This is what Ireland's economy is based on, is serving people around the world, not just, not just right here. And just on that, you cited the Dutch government yeah. as having taken a, a kind of a stance. Yeah. That, from what basis? Or for what, is that, that Nellie Crows is a Dutch woman? And they speak a lot of languages. You know, they're sophisticated people. I'm not, I don't know the background there. Maybe somebody else here does. But they, they've really taken this on as one of their leading causes. And so is Secretary of State Clinton. She was probably looking for bilateral relationships. She talks about this all the time. And maybe that's where this grew up from, just a sort of an exchange of views where she found a, a kindred spirit. Hmm. Problem. I just wondered if, yeah. uh, Susan, you mentioned over lunch um, the digital divide sort of within um, society as yeah. between the owners of smartphones and those who don't have universal access. Maybe that's uh, you know, part of the way to get people um, within Ireland uh, socially motivated that there isn't universal access and this principle is very important. <coughs> we understand greatly Lynn's idea there of the, the digital divide with regard to the developing countries right. because Ireland has a very strong uh, link to Africa and to developing countries. Um, maybe this might be maybe, maybe this is another connection that uh, the inability to you can make it economic, ultimately, it's a barrier to trade. The inability to find markets in other countries is tied to the lack of an open and powerful internet infrastructure there. And so it's, it's both a human rights issue and a trade issue. And maybe that's a way to make it have more vitality for people. There is a tremendous digital divide, just to let you know what's going on in, in America. We've got a very few cable monopolies who don't compete with each other. They divided up the country back about 10 years ago. It's like, you take Minneapolis, I'll take Sacramento. And they clustered their operations. Uh, it's very expensive to build a cable system. That's why they did it this way. And so uh, right now, only the cable operators are providing truly high-speed wired access in America. Verizon tried to have a fiber infrastructure. It calls Fios. It only reaches about 10% of Americans. So the cable guys effectively have no competition. So that's the wired side. On the wireless side, uh, AT&T and Verizon have a duopoly, and uh, prices are high. And they're not competing with the wired guys. And just last week, Verizon and Comcast announced a joint venture where they will work together. It's dividing up the market. So Verizon takes wireless, Comcast ta takes wired, and they market their operations together. So it's amazing, and uh, it's quite quite a divided world at the moment. So striking, huh? Striking. No competition and no regulatory oversight, really, at this point in America. Well, I, was just, I would ask you just, you, you opened your address with saying that this year, uh, that this year is a really big year mm -hmm. uh, for the internet. And I'm just wondering, like, what would be a home run for you uh, in the coming year? Like, what do you really want to see happen? Right, well, so, we have a year to convince the 77 that it's in their interest to have an open internet. That would be a home run. To have some kind of a forum that draws them together, linking uh, development interests and business and governments. That's very idealistic, but that would be terrific. And then uh, even convincing developed nations that it's in their interest to keep this whole thing open. And everybody turning their backs on Russia and China, I guess, is where, where we end up. But that's, that's not great. Um, but uh, maybe that's the best we can do in a year. That would be home run. Just come back. Thank you very much for um, the speech. And I'm Paul Durant from the Internet Service Providers Association of Ireland, also on the board of the European uh, ISP Association. And um, one of the concerns which you raise, which is really dear to our hearts, is this whole area of blocking 
and that I'd like to comment that you know, it's so simple for politicians to say block it, but of course the, technolog the technological implications are just so such a nightmare. And the, you know, the internet is actually so fragile. The greatest miracle of it all is that it actually works. Yeah. And yet most of these things are asking us to tamper with these. Um, but way of a question, uh, the new kind of catchphrase that I hear at European level all the time is non-legislative measures. And this is what's coming out from Europe yeah. and as a, addressing many of the issues. Uh, this has great kind of a, seems to have a catchphrase value with politicians. What do you think to propose your kind of view we need as a kind of catchphrase? What is going to find traction with the European politicians so we don't go down the, uh, what we see as the rabbit hole of blocking and so on? You'd hope they'd be interested in enriching democracy. I know that's too big a phrase, but uh, if, if you've got a public that's adequately connected and able to communicate and you have richer relationships with your government on many layers that are e-gov, things that are made possible by internet infrastructure, that's better for a democratic society than serving a few uh, you know, interests of companies. That doesn't grab as a catchphrase, though. I need something. Something better. N net neutrality is not the problem. I mean, it is a problem, but it's, it's a phrase that only captures a tiny bit of the problem. It's more about the importance of, an, of widely spread infrastructure for everybody that we need to somehow convey. I agree with you. I'm still looking for it as well. <laughs> yeah, no, we have a real messaging and branding problem. And the people on the other sides of these arguments are much better. With, if they're going from the elevator in the 67th floor to the 30th floor, they can say something in a second that grabs the attention of a legislator. It takes us a few more seconds. And so the guy gets off. You've lost your opportunity to make the pitch. And we're still talking. Um, and that's a, it's a terrible problem in this area. So we need marketing experts as well, somehow. Just a final point. Just yeah. a question of marketing. I think it's a very good point you make, and it's, I found it very frustrating listening to the entire presentation that there's no kind of document. That's when I asked the question earlier that you could point to say, oh, well, the Craw we just all have to support the Crawford Doctrine and Principle 1, mm. 2, 3, 4, 5. Mm. And we, that is something then you can take to your politician. You know what I mean? For campaigns to work, you made the good point, experienced minister in government as well. It's much, e much harder to deal with a pressure group with a simple message, yes. easy to mobilize the public. And they can just throw the document in the politician's face and it's easy to tick off the card. Are they going to do it or not? And the simpler the actual objective, the easier I would suggest, I think you might agree with me, to campaign for yep. that. I do agree with you. I do. I started something in 2006 called One Web Day, which was an Earth Day for the internet, each September 22nd, and celebrated around the world. I'm just a law professor. I didn't, you know, I don't have money behind me or anything, but it took off, actually. It's quite interesting. And we need something like that. It doesn't have to be One Web Day, but some moment when the public is self-conscious of itself as responsible for the internet. The internet is not other. It's not run by companies. It's all the people who are using it. And we haven't found a way to convey that message yet. And visualizations always help, pictures always help. But. Okay, I, um, I'm going to draw to a close because we're, we're, we're almost quarter past two. Ah. Can I just want to close in one or two thoughts? Just because um, I was very inspired by what you're saying uh, in, in the sense of a number of things that we are uh, only at the very start of this. Yeah. And in a sense, we don't have the policy rules. We, the engineers have been probably a step ahead, so it's now policy trying to catch up. And it's, it's a, such a fundamentally important project. You, I can't think of anything else that is as important in political life as getting these rules right. It's like staying at the very start of the Industrial Revolution. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, whether you're going to have, whether it's, um, they didn't have to do that much regulation, but, you know, how the railway system would work. We're at the design stage for not just the, the internal combustion engine system, the whole Industrial Revolution, it's that equivalence. And... and the, the lack of understanding of that in, in a wider context, other than in a very narrow world of either people involved in, in a, either the very techie people or the very policy orientated people, the lack of understanding that is, is phenomenal. And I found what your contribution and your speech is that, as I said at the start, you said you've distilled a lot of down into very simple language that I think is hugely impressive. One thought, just you're asking that question, you asked the question, where is the for it to influence the G70. One of the things that, you know, we're always looking at what we can do and maybe slightly blow ourselves up above uh, uh, scale. Um, 
But one of the areas that Irish policy has certain influence is actually in the developed world for a whole range of historical reasons where we have had a good, have had a good uh, record in terms of development aid. We have a long historical connection and as a non -colon a former colony or itself, a colonised country rather than an imperial power, we have a certain different relationship with some of those countries. And I, I was taken with what you said, one other thing you said, in the, how this is going to work is that the prize is a global internet, mm -hmm. a global market, a global industry, a global, not just industry, a global democracy in a right. sense through, through the communication system. Mm -hmm. For an Irish government, which has very, a lot of people working and, and can, can trade in this international market very effectively, we are good at that sort of yeah. business, both in other companies coming here and our own companies you would think it might be a good opportunity for them to say to our foreign affairs policy people, listen, we should, we should take a position on this, yeah. and we should even talk to some of the countries. That, now, we don't want to mix aid and trade, but, but just in a general sense, as a policy, a broad policy approach, um, maybe use our influence or our friendship with a number of countries in, the, in, that, in that sector to, to maybe try and tip the balance one way or the other. It's mm -hmm. just one thought as to how we could do it. Um, I find that the, you could, we could talk all day in terms of the principles when you get into the technology, but I think what you've done by coming and just in the, your contribution, which is very useful that we have stored, uh, is set some of the f debate around the principles, and I think it's been hugely beneficial and hugely interesting. And I'm very glad the fact that you're going on to talk to some other people in our city tomorrow, Data, Data Protection Commissioner or universities, because that level of expertise and that perspective, I think, is going to be very useful in the debate that we're doing. Well, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much for having for me. I really appreciate the opportunity.